Yeah, you got to validate that when you talk to people in incident response, they understand what you're saying. Sending an email about, hey, you have a problem, doesn't make the other side understand what you're actually saying. Welcome to Blue Team Diaries, the podcast that celebrates and honors the professionals who work tirelessly to defend their organizations and those who build tools to support defenders. In each episode, host Peter Manev invites his guests to share their stories and experiences in a fun and lighthearted conversation. Blue Team Diaries is sponsored by Stamus Networks, a global provider of network-based threat detection and response solutions. Learn more at stamus-networks.com. Hello. Today I'm happy to meet with my friend Eric van der Hassel. Eric has more than 15 years of experience as a cybersecurity professional. He's a co-founder of the Shell Company, which provides a wide range of security services for financial and government institutions. Based in Brussels, Belgium, Eric is currently a SOC analysis strategist and lead incident handler for several very large European institutions, where he manages investigations of security events, threats, and helps streamline security operations as well. Hi, Eric. Hello, Peter. Can you share a cool project you have been working on recently? Uh, you know, did you do it by yourself or with, with who? How did you come up with the idea uh, and so forth? One of the projects I'm actually working on right now is the detection of uh, people breaking into databases. So okay. uh, I'm sitting down basically on a weekly basis with uh, Oracle DBAs. And uh, we have split the project into a couple of steps. One of them is actually attacking the database. Uh, pretty cool. So they know way more about databases than I do. Although I was DBA in the past, but technology has moved up. And uh, the cool part is so we attack it, then we try to detect it, and then of course we handle the incidents. So what would be the goal of this project? Like this would be like the goal, the end goal would be to what get better in defense or yeah, basically the the issue was revealed during a red team that we had a couple of issues uh, with attacks on databases and uh, we said like, okay, let's do this the right way. Let's first have fun attacking our own databases with everything we know and then basically try to detect the attacks and take action on it. All right, all right. And... You guys were successful. There was improvement. Or... We're at the we're at the beginning. Uh, we're one more right. thing, and uh, it's looking pretty good already. Yeah. Okay. 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 And I'm suspecting there's learning curve, or uh, there is, is there absolutely a learning curve. There's a lot of false positives, like any projects when you start in the beginning. Uh, it's patience. It's uh, expectation management from. Uh, for the organization it's like okay we don't press a magic button and everything goes that's a very good point actually expectations management in cybersecurity, you know and things like that is, uh, why is it such a difficult thing to to manage it out of curiosity or is it a difficult thing to to manage the expectation on an organizational level it's not only in cybersecurity. If you go to a restaurant, you have expectations about the food. If they don't match, you get upset. Same thing goes in cybersecurity. <laughs> all right, all right, okay, very good, very good. <laughs> well, in that line of thought, uh, can you share with us like a an old crap or a close moment uh, in which you were potentially nearly breached, uh, but uh, your team managed to avert disaster, let's say. Let's put it that way. Is there anything you could share with us? With our the biggest oh, crap moment for me must have been Heartbleed, actually. 
I was okay. working at that. I, I was working at that time for the national government of Belgium, and basically it came out, and we had to defend the complete government. So, plenty of service, and it's like, okay, where do we start? Of course, that was Easter time, so skeleton ah, stuff. Conveniently, uh, then it's like, oh crap, how do we do this? Okay, give me a phone because I need to get a phone. Uh, because emailing, yeah, you need to be certain you speak to the right people, they understand the issues, and then on the other side, you have people testing. So, was it one of those? Uh... <clears throat> I don't know, 24 seven projects for, for like a few days in a row and things like that where nobody slept. Uh, not 24 seven, but let's say they were long work days. Right, 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 right. So part of what you did, you mentioned something very interesting. Part of what you did was like, give me a phone. Uh, mm -hmm. What made it so different in, in that, that incident? Why the phone? Usually it's very difficult to get to talk to somebody, it's like usually uh, an online meeting, an email, things like that. Yeah, you got to validate that when you talk to people in incident response, they understand what you're saying. Sending an email about, hey, you have a problem, doesn't make the other side understand what you're actually saying. So you need to check when you contact them, like, did you understand this? Do you see what the issue is? So basically, it was um, like you had a bigger, basically, you're having a bigger chance of being able to um, explain the problem or, or get a better answer rather than actually. Absolutely, using, absolutely. Say, <clears throat> it becomes interactive. Is that something you always do? Uh, not always. In instance response, depends. I mean, is that something you it always do? Not always. It depends on the scale and on the type of issue, actually. If you and need to contact a whole country, you can't call every citizen of country. <laughs> true, true. And so this specific, uh, let's say, incident, because it's well known, uh, the harp leak and similar things like that, mm -hmm. but um, in, in similar incidents, there's a few every year that are well known and make the news, of course, uh, amongst others. But... Um, during that time, responding to the incidents mm -hmm. or actually managing it, uh, were you satisfied with with your response? And were there any points you thought you could improve uh, overall? Not just your part, but the organization as well. Uh, satisfied? Let's be honest, we're never satisfied. That's the nature of the beast we are. Mm -hmm. It's uh, always a learning curve. You, you talk to people, you reevaluate what you have done, how could it have been done better, uh, how could it have been faster. But yeah, it's somewhere you need to accept it will never be perfect. You're giving it all your best, you're doing it, and in the end, it's learning path. And well, in that line of thought, though, if hard bleed happens again, let's say mm -hmm. version two tomorrow, <laughs> if you go back, is there anything you would have done differently <laughs> during that response or something like that? Uh, differently, probably a hundred things. Uh, realistically, okay. we're in, living in a different world. Uh, when Heartbeat came out, People barely understood what was going on. That that was one of the main issues. We when you were saying like, okay, there is this security mechanism on your server which keeps the the communication between the client and the server uh, secret. Uh, most people like, well, what are you saying? And yeah. Nowadays, TLS SSL is uh, forced, enforced 
so everybody knows the little lock on the top of the screen. So that would be a completely Thanks. different conversation already. Okay, so you think so you're basically saying that because of this incidents, people actually organizations, defenders, they actually evolve to as well with it. Yep. And get better, hopefully. Get better, hopefully. Uh but do they really understand what they're busy with? No. Otherwise we wouldn't have a job. Let's be honest. People make mistakes. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, absolutely. Um, so during that incident, or maybe others too, uh, mm -hmm. out of curiosity, do you have like a favorite go-to tool that you use every day and can do without, for example? The favorite tool I like to use every day is called the Shell. That's why the company I work for is the <laughs> Shell company. It's pretty amazing. The actual actually. shell, the command line. The, the, shell the command line, yeah. It's the first question awesome. I, I ask when I am somewhere. It's like, can I get a command line? Uh, because, yeah, <laughs> I get lost in visual interfaces. <laughs> How often you're successful in getting a command line, actually? Uh, depends. Depends on the customer. <laughs> And on the on the system. In, all right, a little maybe provocative question mm -hmm. out of curiosity. <clears throat> what would be like the first things you would be checking out when you get that shelf, when you get on that command line? Well, I'm assuming you have some sort of an agenda. You've done this many times, so <laughs> if it's not too revealing, well, what's the first thing that you that, that you would jump in on doing there? Uh, usually I need to check if I'm on the right system first <laughs> it's something stupid but you got to be sure you're on the right system otherwise it's not because the host name says it is this that it actually is That's a very good point, actually. <laughs> Not because the host name says it, it is that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what would you do if you can't use the shell, actually? What would be your fallback? Uh, yeah, most things have uh, APIs. Uh, I like to program in Python, so I go back to my Python. I have a shell in Python, <laughs> of course. Um, <laughs> That's where I start from. So right. you start, right. you start okay. the, uh, the REPL and then you, you load your libraries. Okay, but <clears throat> that actually implies that, you know, okay, a person of your caliber, of course, like knows what to do, how to do, um, and similar things in all situations. So you immediately have a fallback plan and mm -hmm. all those things. So. In that line of thought, do you think the tool is as important as the person using using it? Is is one more important than the other, for example, or things like that? Uh, well, if you you become a chef, you get knife training. Uh, same thing with us. When when you start learning this, you get to get to use all your tools and need to spend your hours with your tools. Do it over and over again until it becomes second nature. The tool doesn't matter if you're not trained with it. Sure, sure, I, I agree. So, in other words, <clears throat> if you don't know what to do with the tool, even if it's the best tool in the world, it wouldn't be as helpful, right? I guess. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's it's painful to see some people make yeah, mistakes because they do not understand what they are actually working with. All right, and, and what's going on and, and, and similar things. Um, well, so here we are, we're talking about instant response and 
and I appreciate I, I appreciate you sharing with us all the uh, uh, the tips and tricks of the trade, so to speak. Uh, and I am um, totally understand that you cannot share probably too much information because I know the nature of I had the pleasure of knowing the nature of stuff that you do in instant response some of the instant response tasks that you do so uh, um, I appreciate not everything could be shared but here we are talking now about incident response and uh, and uh, you know well, what, what to do and what not to do and, sim and similar um, if somebody is watching and listening to us and uh, thinking about becoming a cyber defender right if you have one piece of advice to give to that person uh, what would it be? Uh, it, there is this way of approaching problems like zoom into them and then take 10,000 steps back. And it's a good idea to do that in our domain. It's like, okay, let's see what I can learn, go really deep into it, and then step back like, okay, how does this fit in a complete IT picture, how does this fit in a business picture, and make a story from it. And verify that story with the people around you, business side, technical people, everybody you can get your hands on, like, okay, I see this, do you see the same thing? That's, I think, the most important skill. And... In that line of thought as well, what motivates you to work in this field? Like what made you choose cybersecurity and not, I don't know, car sales, for example, or something else, or marketing or accounting? I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, uh, it was pretty early on. I noticed that I had a preference for everything which was sciences uh, when I was studying. And uh, I dabbled a bit in chemistry, but in the end, yeah, it became obvious that IT was my thing and cybersecurity was something like, hmm, this is cool. I was like 14 years old and I managed to get things from a computer nobody else seemed to be able to do. And from one came the other. All right, okay. So at 14, something turned your attention towards IT in general or towards IT security specifically? Was there uh, an incident or something like that? Or it was because you were discovering things that nobody else could I do? was discovering. Uh, we were back, what was it? The Windows 3.11, 3.195 was distributed in Belgium over the whole IT landscape. Uh, 95 was on the, the kits, like yeah, on the floppies. Some people had CD ROMs, <laughs> Ooh. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, you, you go in and people tell you, no, that's not possible. And then it's like, hang on, but when I do this, the system says that, so let's try this, and then gradually you learn, and when you're stuck, you ask people that know more than you questions and they show you things and you ask questions and... all right all right is there anything that you thought is scarier than actually is uh, which could be stopping people from pursuing a career in cyber security you think uh it never ends it's a very dangerous field if you do not know when to say stop yourself you can live online 24 seven reading about attacks, playing uh, with tools 24 seven and you will die from it. Uh, body um, needs to rest, brain needs to rest. And you know, need to know when to say stop, spend some time with friends and family, have a beer, have some laughs. That's a very interesting perspective. I must admit that I actually, uh, 
I never thought about it quite like that way, you know what I mean? That it never stops, and it's actually true, it, it never does stop. Uh, there's always something new <clears throat> to learn, to see, there's always something, there's always a new threat, and things like that. But I never thought about it from the perspective of it never stops actually that could be that could be a scary thing uh, and this is it's a, it's a, it's actually and awesome the nice uh, part is i think if if there's something really important uh only last week uh i got i'm busy in the financial world right now i got a call from a guy who works in luxembourg who works, sits in the financial industry who was just calling me to say like hey have you seen this I wasn't working that day because I was doing something else, but I didn't miss out on it. I knew when I got home, I had to check some things. So there's ways around it. You do not need to sit 24 hours a day behind the keyboard. You just need to drink with a guy, sometimes a beer. And you probably learn a few things that you wouldn't have. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um so is there final question would you like to give a shout out to any mentors or uh, that helped you or colleagues uh, uh, that actually helped you become the expert you are yes uh absolutely it's uh all starting from let's say the year 2000 everybody i basically met uh, for example Xavier Mertes who gave me a show on his system uh, who re used to run rootshell.be uh, I only met him years later at an OWASP conference and uh, yeah ever since we're friends uh, I read plenty of blogs run into people by going to conferences so big shout outs to them uh, the the way we met was also like hey give peter a call okay i'll give peter a call <laughs> that that's how uh, how things happen and that's the nice part about it and i'm very thankful um the other way too um, i'm very thankful that uh you, you gave me a call you gave us a call i i uh, i've learned a good few things uh, uh, from you as well. Uh, I'm very thankful for the opportunity. Um, and I, I also want to thank you for being part of the, the blue team, the defense, and um, and helping out in, in any way, shape, or form you can, um, especially with your, uh, with your expertise. Uh, I think we've known each other for a while. Um, <clears throat> and last time I saw you, um, we were actually... Um, at FOSDEM, uh, to be very honest, Absolutely. and um, it was uh, it was it was also a learning experience for me as well. Uh, so, and uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is thank you very much for being with us here today and sharing uh, your experience and for doing what you do. Um, as always, Blue Team was always an inspiration. Um, Eric van der Helsen, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for celebrating and honoring the Defenders with Blue Team Diaries. You can find this and all our previous episodes on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. If you're interested in learning more about our sponsor, Stamus Networks, please visit stamus-networks.com.